What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Community Farm Alliance podcast. I'm your host for the Black and Berry series. My name is Vaughn Barnes, and I have with me today the legend, Jim Embry, out of Richmond, Kentucky, of Atris Blue Farms. Jim, tell us, how are you doing out there today? And I'm wonderful, man. Every day is a blessing, you know, and it's, um, it's wonderful to be in your presence. And thank you for uh, scheduling this um, time for us to have a conversation. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, the questions and uh, being able to share things that uh, your listening audience, our audience, will be uh, informed and inspired by. Man, you have so much information out on the Internet right now. There was a video that I watched of you. I think, man, you was either in California, Hawaii. I mean, you traveled everywhere. Yes, sir. And you mentioned the word griot. Uh -huh. Griot. Yeah, yeah, griot uh, is a, an, an African term that symbolizes that person who was entrusted, uh, with the knowledge of his or her people, that person through oral history, uh, different from a written record, that person was able to, to tell the story, uh, of his or her people, his, their, their tribe, their village. It can go back thousands of years. Uh, that's a griot. And, it, and, it, and, and, and I would say that, that most uh, indigenous peoples all around the world had a similar person because before the um, advance of, of, of writing systems, then humans uh, relied on uh, their memory to carry this, these stories of our human maturation, the, carry the story of our of our saga and our journey. So I use that uh, oftentimes for myself. Uh, I recall speaking at one of the STEM programs that my daughter runs out at, out at Stanford University. Right. And I, I, I did a little, uh, little rap tune <laughs> as I began that calling myself the OG. And I had a little, I forget now the exact words, but I call myself the OG, which is original gardener, original griot. <laughs> And my grandkids call me, uh, as my kids call me Baba, so my grandkids call me Grandbaba. So I use the word, uh, 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 the griot was in that kind of a sense of, of, of what an OG is. So I take uh, great pride in, in being, again, uh, given by my family that responsibility of being the, uh, the griot within this, uh, what we call now the 21st century. And then I guess with that role, it's your, your job to then pass on the stories to the next generation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, that's so important. You know, and a lot of our work, I recall uh, you had laid a question out, you know, here today about, you know, discussion topics about the future. And in my view, you know, our future is, is, is a sustainable, just future. It's based upon how well we remember and how well we embrace these uh, ancestral vibrations, the traditional ways that humans employed for thousands of years, okay, for thousands of years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's important to, to pass on these kinds of um, stories. Uh, I would call Vaughn, honestly, uh, my mother was, before, before I was a griot, my mother was a griot, and before she was a griot, her grandfather, who was born in a slave condition uh, and uh, at four or five years old, and then his father fought in the Civil War and also died in the Civil War. But uh, so, we, so, so I come from a long line of, of folk in the family who accepted the responsibility of being the family griot. But I must say, when I was young, 10, 12 years old, I'd sit around uh, like we're doing now this evening family meetings and family gatherings and we're, you know, we're eating and grandmom's making quilts and we're just sitting around talking, you know, and right. mom would tell these stories. Okay. Now we hear Vaughn these stories eight, 10, sometimes 12 times a year. Okay. <laughs> and over 10 years. So, so I would tell I to my mother, I was looking, I said, Mama, I heard that story 10 times this year already. I've heard it the last 10 years of my life. Okay. I would ask her, when do we get 
a different story. And she said, son, she says, one day you're going to be thankful to me, okay? But I'm telling you stories so you can remember them. And now I know what she means. Mm. Now, in that same, at, at that same time, what you're saying that you understand it now, what is the difference now for you? Because you mentioned this in one of those videos, not in... You said you want people to come to the farm and hear you. Yes. What? Why now do you feel that there's a difference oh. in importance? Oh, oh well, hey, I'm 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 a much. You know, what things that humans do, you know, we mature. I had mentioned I was ten or twelve years old, you know, and when right. you're that age as an adolescent, you know, you think you know everything, uh, you know, and you have a kind of rambunctious, know-it-all attitude. And that was, that's just a common aspect of that maturation uh, of us as a human, human species. But it didn't take long for me to understand that at 15 years old, in 1964, I marched with Dr. King at the March of Frankfurt. I was the, uh, the state youth uh, president for the NAACP. Uh, and I had, I had been a part of CORE since I was 10 years old. I was on picket lines, being spit on, being you know, cussed out. So oh. So at a young age, I, I, I was brought into a kind of leadership role because my mother, okay, was the, the core president. But again, her father, uh, I'm sorry, her, her grandfather, again, who was enslaved. And after emancipation, his, his mother inspired him to go to uh, Berea College in 1879. So we've been, that's why I say I'm, I say I'm like an, an agrarian intellectual activist as was my mother, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Uh, but my uh, great-grandfather went to Berea in 1879, and he was there the same year as Bond as a guy named James Bond. That's not, you know, Sean Connery in 007. That's the James Bond who was the grandfather of Julian Bond. And, and they all were there at, at, at Berea College. And uh, so again, I come from a long line of, 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 of folk you know, who were um, who not only told the story of family, but who were activists in their communities. My grandfather, great grand, so great grandfather, uh, in the 30s, and her mom would tell the story. <coughs> uh, they would catch the bus on a Saturday morning to go into town to uh, to buy things, you know, that were family essentials, you know, right. shoes and clothing and things like that. And right. the bus oftentimes would fill up uh, with people. And when the bus filled, this is in the 30s now, uh, when the bus would fill up, then they were told by the bus driver, hey, you all get up out of your seats and stand up and give your seats to the nice white people who got on. And mama told the story uh, that my granddad would say, well, what did you pay to ride the bus? I said a nickel. He said, I paid a nickel too, and we're not getting up. And they would put off the bus. This is in the 30s, 20 years before the historic Rosa Park sit down. But again, but there were thousands of people uh, like my, my uh, great grandfather who did things like that. Uh, but those but, but those kind of stories are the stories. So on the land that we're on here now, okay, <laughs> that's where these folks, okay, were, 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 were after emancipation, were making a community, making lives, uh, purchasing property, creating farms. And, and my grandfather, you know, he was a school teacher small farmer, the area butcher. He also cut hair, was also a shoe cobbler, and he and his brother were also on the blacksmith shop. So they could do a whole bunch of things. And so all those ancestral vibrations are on this land. And as, as, you, as I was telling you, then part of, uh, of our farm now, it's like a center for education. that CFA is a nonprofit organization that supports family farms, equity work, food access, and policy work across Kentucky. If you're interested in supporting any of this work, please go to cfaky.org and go to our donate tab in order to donate or become a member today. We really appreciate any and all help that we get, and it goes back to helping both farmers and consumers across the bluegrass state.
For more information, go to www.cfaky.org. Once again, that's www.cfaky.org. Thank you. And now back to our show. Before we left on the first break, you mentioned a lot of the history that went on at the at the property. Can you talk about some of the differences on how you reimagined that same space? Yeah, well, again, just to uh, be clear, I came back to the farm 10 years ago to do elder care, and that meant two kinds of elder care. Look after my aunt and uncle uh, who lived next door, who were both 90 years old. They're like second parents to me. And the uh, house I live in now is also about 90 years old, but the house was empty. Uh, nobody was living here so our cousins and mine had like a little meeting with the family and we thought it would be good to have somebody move back uh to to, to the farm to look after our aunt and uncle who were both 90 and to fix up this old house <laughs> that i live in that was the reason why i came back and i spent the first four or five years doing what i call uh, everyday kinds of elder care it was a wonderful blessing to do that but then my cousins i mean my aunt and uncle them jokers, would you believe, Vaughn, they died on me? I said, where in the heck are y'all going? <laughs> Cousin Jimmy, you know, we're 94, 95, you know, we got to cross the Chile Jordan. We got to go to the Pearly Gate till we got to join. <laughs> I said, y'all can't leave me here. <laughs> anyway, so then I, I had a little more free time to begin to think about, uh, as you said, reimagining, you know, the farm and what it could mean. Right. Right now, uh, the farm, uh, I, I wear different hats, okay, on the farm. One is that, that we're doing things, of course, in the ground and a variety of things. Uh, one of my first efforts was to uh, create the farm as a habitat for pollinators. Uh, we've got about, again, about 30 acres here, and it's about 12 acres of the pasture land is under, uh, thanks to the NRCS, uh, mm -hmm. part of the USDA, is a 12 acre pollinator habitat and forage area. Uh, wow. with about 25 different kinds of, of, of forbs, meaning grasses, annuals, and perennials to help create this needed biodiversity. When I was growing up here in this community, those things were all there, but we've been impacted a lot by kind of a thinking to, to cut down the habitat and, and do things that causes pollinators to, um, to decline. So in your years of seeing uh, the farm from where it was and where it's at now, and also the community, what are some of the biggest changes that you've noticed? Oh, well, uh, one is again, that around the farm here now, uh, we're probably 30 farms that were owned by African-Americans. And we were all, again, some fashion related. Uh, that's been a huge change, not just in Kentucky, here where I live at, Matthew County, but across the state and across the nation. Uh, it's like the loss of what um, we call uh, uh, black farmland. Uh, but we've been blessed, I must say. And on my in-law side of the family in West Kentucky, we own the Martin Acres. We own a thousand acres. It's been their family uh, since again, since the uh, uh, 1870s or so. So we've been very fortunate, have held onto this property, this land all those years. That's been a huge change. Uh, but what's also changed is that uh, many people who now own the properties are not really farming. They have these big, huge, what I call them McMansions, big homes. They come in there, they bulldoze down all the trees, all the bushes, uh, and it's just a big house and then 10 acres of grass, I call it green concrete, uh, no biodiversity, which then impacts the decline of pollinators. And pollinators are at the basis of agriculture, okay? Right. Uh, over half of our food that we consume requires, uh, you know, pollination, uh, and but it's been impacted in, in all kinds of ways. The, the huge houses that have just grass, uh, the uh, lack of flowering trees and bushes, the use of uh, the overuse of chemicals and sprays, herbicides and whatever, all mm. impact pollinators. So we're trying on on, on this land of ours, this family uh, property, to change that uh, scenario. That's why we have, again, about a third of the land is devoted to what we call this pollinator conservation project. Even before we did that three years ago, I had taken the front of the yard and this image behind me is right. one of the images 
uh, I have uh, growing down here about about 40 or 50 different kinds of perennials where I do I have I have flowers vines that bloom all year long. I mean, wow. I have right now I have in the yard out here now was called a helloborus and they must have their own antifreeze. Okay. <laughs> but they're out there <laughs> it has now, been okay? The helloborus is and pretty soon uh, you'll see here uh, probably late March, April, you'll see these fields of, 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 um, of daffodils. I've got all kinds of trees and bushes and many of them are medicinal or whatever. Try to again, provide not only the beauty, uh, but the, uh, this area of, of great diversity. I'm a beekeeper as well. So the idea of having the pollinator pastures then corresponds to being a beekeeper. Uh, and I just harvested, you know, some honey here uh, about a month ago. And uh, so um, we're hoping that uh, eventually we will, we will be able to take that, those hives and create our own uh, jar of honey named after, again, our great uncle, Atris Ballou. So you're going to see, you know, the old guy, he's going to be 100 years old, Vaughn, okay? But this is hard. <laughs> and we had, by the way, we had seven folk in our family who were either first generation after emancipation, meaning they were enslaved, or first generation, you know, children who were the children of people who enslaved, had seven folk lived to be 100 years old. And our great uncle who lived here in this house was one of those. So uh, Where, I, where's I, the well? I have a honey jar with his picture on there, okay? And, and that would be a way to teach again the history by selling the honey uh, that, we're, that we're harvesting, the beehives, but also retelling his story. So the, the question I got to know is where's the well at? Where y'all hiding the well? Like, <laughs> well, we have well, two ponds. Found the you. <laughs> how do y'all well, keep you, everybody? Well, I, I think well, part, of the, part of the well is it's eating from the land. Okay, eating, eating from, from, talk about local food. Now, we was, them folks was doing local food before Kentucky Proud ever was thought of and before local, folks local. like CFA and whoever else and Oak we're talking about organic food and local food. Our folk were doing that, okay? We were right here on these farms uh, during the emancipation, after emancipation, farming organically, farming sustainably, cooperatively, okay? That's how we were doing it. And we were eating largely a diet that was mostly plant-based. Okay, my mom, she would say, well, hey, we're cutting Jim, you know, or, or she said, well, Jim, you know, you're, you began Good Foods Co-op and, and you talk about organic food, well, we didn't call it that. That's what we were doing, you know. Uh, so humans have been farming organically for about 12,000 years. It's only been since World War One and World War Two, what we now call conventional farming came in with the use of all kinds of chemicals and herbicides and pesticides has been a recent phenomenon. So, uh, but again, so part of the idea of what was the well was eating really healthy food, okay, <laughs> working hard, okay. Right. And having a great community of folk that you can, you know, interact with, the love of people, love of community, living with purpose was what created the well of this really good health of folk, you know, and it's changed a lot. Not only have our farms become sicker, okay, but people have also become sicker. The environment, the environment is sicker because we have, you know, we have, as we, humans, we have adopted this, this very human-centric almost Eurocentric worldview that has impacted our lives and health and environment. So we're trying to change all that right here at the Atchis Ballou Farm. <laughs> Farmers Market Support Program Services. Did you know that a program like this exists in the state of Kentucky? If your market has been around for a while, or maybe you are a new and existing market, we offer marketing development. We also offer business development. We want to offer programs as such like capital support to support your market managers. There's a cost share program. We can establish your market with the SNAP EBT program. And lastly, we provide networking. For more information, please contact us at cfaky.org forward slash FMSE. Again, that is cfaky.org forward slash FMSE. 
ASP. What is the future of Atris Blue Farm? Of course, right on the farm, we have a variety of products uh, that, that we have been making available here for uh, several years. Uh, you mentioned my cousin Tiffany next door, uh, who has every year this women's retreat, has been taking some of the medicinal herbs off the farm, you know, the elderberries, the mint, uh, packaging them up and providing for folk, you know, these kinds of value added products. I mentioned that, uh, you know, we've been beekeeping for a couple of years and we see ourselves uh, producing uh, a honey, not only for uh, the market, say the farmer's market, and the honey will be named for our, for again, our, uh, my dear great uncle Atris Ballou, who was a centenarian, he'd be a hundred. So he must know something, okay. Uh, but we'll have, we'll have that. Uh, and also, I've also, I've been in the hot tunnel, been growing all kinds of watermelons and tomatoes. I grew last year, 15 kinds of tomatoes, about 10 kinds of peppers, uh, six or eight kinds of, of, of beans. And those items, rather than going to the market, let's say, of, of a, I've been taking them to cousins of mine, as well as some of the food banks in the Madison County and the Fayette County area as a, just a, a gift and donation to folks who have a need, you know, for some wholesome kinds of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're um, also uh, on the farm, you know, we see ourselves also as an educational center. So a product, we, we oftentimes invite people to come here for tours. Uh, this, this past fall, I had, uh, you know, some dear friends uh, from, from UK who brought out a, uh, a, a class at UK in, in Black history that came out and spent some time doing that. Uh, and we probably do, oh, probably 10 or 12 tours, uh, you know, a year with church groups, school groups, and so forth. Uh, yes, and um, so, and like in April, I'm hosting here uh, uh, on the farm in Berea, I'm hosting about 30 people who will be coming to the farm from, you know, Harvard, Princeton, American University, uh, University of Vermont, uh, uh, Spelman, Tuskegee, uh, all around the whole, uh, the whole project around seeds. I joined about a year and a half ago, the Ujama Seeds, uh, Ujama Farms uh, Cooperative Alliance, and part of our focus is around seed, becoming seed farmers. And so uh, right now on the property, we have a, uh, a project uh, going on with a UK uh, graduate student <clears throat> who is uh, doing a project, a research project around uh, collard greens, sorghum and okra, for example. Uh, we have, we're part of what's called the heirloom, uh, I'm sorry, the heirloom collard project. And we have it in our collection, Ujama Seeds, about 30 different kinds of okra that we send out to people saying, hey, we want you all to know not just one kind of okra. We have 30 in our collection and we ask folks then to, to grow these out and send them back to our Ujama Farms cooperative to sell in our, in our new, in our, in our catalog. So that's part of our product is like a site for research projects, okay? Uh, we also, uh, I do an annual, around my birthday in April, I do what's called uh, the, the butterfly, uh, birthdays and butterflies. It's like a weekend experience devoted to butterflies and pollinators. Uh, it's very child friendly, kids come out, parents, and we have uh, a, the kids get a chance to actually plant things uh, in the garden, in the orchard. I mentioned before, I've got about 30, going on 40 different trees in my orchard, okay? Every kind of tree imaginable, apples, peaches, pears, plums, you know, uh, uh, cherries and so forth. And you can look at the trees, you can tell, well, those are the trees, them folks planted like 10 years ago, and, the, and them are the ones they planted last year. Uh, now, so that's kind of what's going on in terms of uh, different kind of products. Uh, we, we, we've also, this past fall, uh, went to a mushroom workshop and got some uh, mushroom log inoculations. We have on the property different kinds of uh, wooded areas. So we are, our part of our plan is to begin to um, uh, have these uh, supplies of mushrooms that are growing in these uh, uh, wooded areas. And, and then those, again, those products could become items that we sell somewhere at a market, but right. it could also be 
a, a educational workshop. So we're believing in wearing different kinds of hats. Gotcha. Uh, just having products. Also, you know, I'm a, I'm a prolific writer. I, 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 I write probably eight or 10 different articles a, a year. I'm working on uh, several um, books on my own. I've been invited to write a foreword for a republication of a biography of Dr. Carver. So I've taken this farm and its legacy and its history. Right. And I've taken that to the level of doing documentaries, doing articles, uh, you know, this um, book here uh, that's called We Are Each Other's Harvest. I have an essay in, in this book, and the essay is about this farm and my family and that legacy and, and my great grandfather's, you know, friendship with, with people like Carver, Du Bois, so forth. So you mentioned that you have other universities that come out to the farm and do research projects. Yes. What connection has the HBCUs had with your property? Oh, well, hey, I mean, you know, I'm a believer. I've been mean, this for a long time, Vaughn, okay? I'm, I've been around since the dinosaurs. Uh, I know all kinds of people. <laughs> so I have, I believe my, I have direct connections with most of the universities here in Kentucky. Berea, EKU here in Madison County, UK. I went to school there, worked there 20 years. It's like that university, KSU, absolutely. And I've, and I've gotten different kinds of support, financial equipment support, let's say from Kentucky State, you know, uh, they help fund the expansion of our of our bee colony. And nice. I'm now the proud, you know, father of about, you know, 100,000 bees out here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you care enough. And uh, so they've, you know, I've, I've gone, I don't know, for the last even oh, 15 years or so to the uh, like a, a KSU small uh, farm conference and so forth. I've also got some connections to the Ujama, uh, Ujama Seed Cooperative, uh, connections with uh, Spellman, who were down there this fall, Tuskegee, and so forth. And they'll all be here again in April. What is the importance? Because you, you mentioned history. How important is it to have HBCUs involved with farming? Well, I think it's, it's, it's critical, you know, because uh, as we know, post-emancipation, it was HBCUs all across the South, and in particular, Tuskegee and George Washington Carver, that allowed African Americans to survive and to thrive. It was those institutions that provided that kind of sensibility, a good sensibility. All the things now going on with regenerative agriculture and organic agriculture, what Carver was preaching and writing about, okay, for 50 years, bless his heart, if we listened to him, we wouldn't be the problem that we're in now. Uh, but again, those HBCUs only provided that sense of agricultural uh, sensibility and great farming practices, but they also provided just educational outlets. As we know, you know, black folk, you know, couldn't go to the uh, 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 white historically uh, universities. Okay, so it was HBCUs that provided those kinds of platforms of education for uh, for our folk to to value education and become in their community the kind of leaders, the teachers, the thinkers, uh, you know, the historians. Uh, we're all processed through all, all because of HBCUs. So now part of our role, like with Deion Sanders, you know, here recently uh, 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 engaging in his, uh, I think, first college coaching experience at Jackson State, we have to, I think as a people, we have to reinvest in an HBCUs, not just money, but time, commitment, these kind of collaborations. So, so that, I mean, they've been critical uh, uh, not only in the history of African Americans, they've been critical in the history of America, and now we have to reinvest and, and love and embrace uh, the, the, the current role of HBCUs. Right. Now, everybody knows this is the Blackberry series, and I have to ask this question. What berry best represents Atris Blue Farm and Jim Embers? Well, man, I don't know why you, you, you saved the easy question for last, okay? It's clearly <laughs> blackberries, okay? Because right here on this farm, when I was growing up, the primary berry that in July, usually, that we'd go out and pick would be blackberries. And we had to kind of like, you know, arm ourselves with, we used to wear these little um, um, uh, wrist bracelets with, with, with coal oil 
trying to ward off the chiggers because you, if you didn't go out there and protect yourself, not only, we, we, you might come home with gallons of blackberries, but you would also come home with chiggers and itching. So, uh, so, so blackberries have a, a, a just a real clear memory uh, on the farm of how delicious they were. And again, at Night House here is where my aunt uh, Patty lived. That she died real young uh, from uh, from diabetes. But anyway, but she would make these incredible blackberry cobblers. Okay, and then oh, on the no. farm here, we would make our own ice cream. We would have these you know these freezer units, and we'd be out there churning you know the ice cream freezer, make that another ice cream to go on that mm. warm uh, blackberry cobbler. Also, uh, blackberry is important for me because. One of my uh, one of the, the main fruit that uh, was used in my early career of winemaking, okay, was the blackberry, okay, and uh, so I learned from my my great uncle here and my grandmother uh, the the process of making wine uh, from the blackberry, and uh, and oftentimes and we were always told, now y'all go out in the field and pick up some blackberries and don't eat them all, okay. <laughs> Man, I could imagine. So yeah. I know we get into the end of the interview and I don't want to keep you too long, but is there any one message that you can give any upcoming farmers or people that are inspiring to get into regenerative agriculture? Well, I would say that, that the most important question of this century for every human being, not just farmers. And by the way, my friend Wendell Berry says that eating is an agricultural act. So we're all involved in agriculture. We all eat every day and we're eating from what farmers are growing. And part of our need is to understand these kind of connections, okay, with agriculture, that we're all part of the agricultural movement uh, and whatever. But I would say that recognize that the land, the flora, the fauna, our ancestors are important parts of our memory, okay? And yes, that's, we need to return to the land in all kinds of ways. Some of us can, can, like me, can come back to some acres, acres of land. But every person needs to find some way to connect with their ancestors and connect with the land because they're all one and the same. Well, that's it, folks. And as I always like to say the mantra, real change comes from the ground up. Until next time. Peace.